gotten it or and we've had to several times supply them why we can supply you with with the transcript or the tape whatever you'd like that's the only taping that goes on <laughs> right out in the open when's your next trip south when are you planning anything? Oh, golly. I don't look that far ahead on the schedule. I, I get scared if I do. <laughs> Nancy's there today. She's in Houston, but that's on the drug matter down there. You got a sore throat? Huh? You got a sore throat? No, I think I was talking and... See, I'm a little addicted to... to allergies. I, I was a hay fever sufferer until I began taking shots for it, but it, uh, I have found out that Washington and Sacramento have something in common. They're both allergy capitals. Uh, I, was, I didn't sound this way up at Camp David, <laughs> but I do when I come back here. It's, um, and I think as much of it is inside as, as out. And, it, and I can go away for a few days and it's fine. But, uh, you want to venture a guess? What? You want to venture a guess on uh, who's going to come out on top uh, tomorrow? Democratic no. field? <laughs> no, I'll let them have that all to themselves. And decide. Want, to t want to tell us who you would prefer to face? Uh, no, nope, nope. I'll offer no help in who they might want to select. Would you tell us if you've been at all surprised by Gary Hart's surge in the, in the uh, primary so far? Well, maybe might not have picked that, and yet I, I think I can understand a kind of a a new face, and uh, but I I still think that it's too early to really be naming any front runners or anything in that race. There's a lot of long, having having gone through a series of primaries. Uh, there's a long way to go. Mr. President, I, uh, a lot of us pundits have been predicting that this race would turn into a generational conflict. Uh, I recall you in the past uh, talking about how fondly how uh, America needs to return to the stature and to the values of its past. Will you be adjusting that strategy uh, if you are facing an opponent who talks about, uh, compares himself back in the future and, and uh, as opposed to the politics of the past? No, I, uh, I have always felt and based any campaigning or anything that I do on what we do, uh, not what the other fellow says he's going to do, what we do and what we plan to do, and that's the way I would campaign. Uh, I don't see any need for any generational struggle in here, but if there is, maybe we can settle it with an arm wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> is it true what Gary Hart says, that, that you and Walter Mondale represent the politics of the past? No, as a matter of fact, uh, it might be in the past in that uh, uh, to the extent that some of the things were principles that this country was based on, but uh, I think that what we've done has been a departure, certainly from the past 40 odd years of democratic domination in the country, which they have held both houses of the Congress. Mr. President, can you? Can you give us some idea about what you would do uh, in the next term to control the deficits? Uh, are we talking, would, would you, are you considering possibly uh, another increase or an increase in taxes uh, by changing the system, say, or would you make any further cuts in entitlement programs? 
we are we are looking at and have been and this is nothing new right. uh, what we think are uh, so-called loopholes uh, that offer not quite uh, fair uh, benefits to some and, and not to all we have also discussed and I've asked the Treasury Department to look into something that can't happen in this coming year. It's going to take more study than this, and that is a, a simplification of uh, our tax structure. We need to look at ways to get the billions and billions of dollars that are being, uh, are not being paid in taxes, owed by people legitimately, and not by way of loopholes. In this instance, just outright violations of the tax code. Mm -hmm. uh, to that extent, we, yes, we're going to do that, but for the future, we have to bring down the percentage of the gross national product that government is taking in this country. See, I have, I have a degree in economics myself. Now, that doesn't make me an authority because I don't think uh, economists are authorities. It's an inexact science. But I do remember that when I was getting my degree, it was more or less a standard uh, acceptance in economics that the business cycles, so-called, and the uh, lean periods previous to that, or to what we now call recessions and depressions, when they did occur, that usually it was when the government had gone beyond a certain point in the percentage of gross national product that it was taking. And that was just more or less accepted as standard. Well, I think it is very true today, and I think that after we get what we've called a down payment, which we, is about all we can get in this year with the limited time that Congress is going to be here, then I think in a bipartisan way, we're going to have to continue to look at government as to how structurally we can reduce the share that government is taking. Can you give us an idea, though? I mean, could you give us some specifics about what you might do? I mean, what? Well, let me give them in this, to this extent. Some of them you could look at, and they, and they could be contained in the Grace Commission or committee reports. Here, is, um, here was a look at government by almost 2,000 top business and leaders in the private sector, not only from institutions and so forth, but from the business and financial world that looked at government as they would look at a business if they were thinking of merging or taking it over, as to things that are wrong and that could be changed. And we are really seriously looking at, uh, at these recommendations, 2,478 or 28, but anyway, it's almost 2,500 uh, recommendations that they've made, and many of them would require legislative uh, action because they would result in changes in procedure and the processes of government. In the, Sir, in the negotiations that have been going on the last few weeks on this down payment that you referred to, what concessions have you expressed willingness to make uh, and what concessions might you be willing to make for your part in these negotiations? Well, frankly, I've lost a little faith in the bipartisan approach to this because the other side seemed more interested, I think, in politics than they did in meeting us in any way on trying to uh, to achieve this down payment. So I am and have been meeting with the leadership of our own in the House and in the Senate uh, on that very thing and will be willing once we all come to agreement and have settled on a plan, and I can't go beyond that because we haven't, but I will be willing then to go forward with our own proposal and hope that uh, we can with the support of the of the people that we uh, can get bipartisan support for it. So you're saying you haven't even put forth a proposal the yet? What? You have not even yet put forth a proposal in these negotiations? I don't quite well, understand. Well, this, this is in our own discussions within, I might say, the family, meaning the Republican leadership in both the House and Senate ourselves. We are we're discussing, and there are a number of viewpoints on uh, figures having to do with spending reductions and uh, uh, I think we're pretty much agreed on that uh, tax revenues would be, if there are any, would be obtained from 
corrections in the tax program and not in any change in the rates. Mr. President, not too long ago, your, uh, your finance chairman in Mississippi, William Munger, was reflecting back on the Republicans' defeat in the gubernatorial race in that state last year. And he said that uh, uh, in order for Republicans to do well in Mississippi, they had to attract black votes. But if they went, did the things necessary to attract black votes, they'd be going against Republican philosophy. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. Uh, no, I think everything that we've done in our economic approach is beneficial to everyone. Uh, I know that there are charges being made, I listened to the debate, uh, that uh, somehow our, our uh, attempts at economies and all have penalized people who were dependent on government aid. That is a falsehood. The simple fact of the matter is we're spending more on help for the people and for the needy than has ever been spent before in history. Our budget cuts have been reductions in the increase planned in spending. We haven't come to some place where we're uh, spending less than, uh, than had been spent. But, sir, blacks in Alabama say that they're not going to vote for you. They say they're going to vote for the Democrat, whoever he is. How are you going to counter what they perceive to be uh, an administration that it doesn't have their interest at all. Well, you said the key word that they perceive to be, and I'm just going to hope that in the campaign we can reveal to them that they have not been given the truth, that they are the victims of a lot of demagoguery that has portrayed us as guilty of things that we haven't done. Do you think that all the campaigning among eight contenders for the Democratic nomination has changed public perception of you along those lines and along other lines? Um, well, even before a campaign started, this has been pretty much the theme of the other side. I have been held up as uh, eating my young. Uh, that, we, that we have been uh, hostile to the poor and uh, our tax program benefits the rich. How can a program that cuts taxes evenly, percentage-wise, across the board, thus leaving the same rate of progression in our progressive tax system, how can that be beneficial to the rich and uh, detrimental to uh, the others? How can it be unfair to the people of lower income or the poor to reduce inflation from double digits, 12.5%, uh, we came here, down to a third of that or less, less than a third of that, when the people with the least, let's take someone with $10,000 of income uh, between 19, through two years, 1979 and 1980, before we got here. By the end of 1980, that $10,000 would only buy $8,000 worth. He was getting $5,000 a year. He got a $1,000 cut in his ability to buy each year. Um, that was probably the, the, the worst tax on the elderly with fixed incomes, the worst tax on the, the poor who have to spend most of their earnings on subsistence, on the necessities. The person with a luxury income who spends a minor portion of it on necessities, the rest on luxuries, uh, they weren't really penalized as much by inflation. So I think that everything we've done has been beneficial to everyone at every level. You mentioned the elderly. If I could ask about that, a, a large elderly population in Florida, and they, many voters seem to be uh, convinced that you, more than the Democrats, have been trying to restrain the growth or cut back entitlement programs such as Social Security and Medicare. First of all, is that a, a correct perception, and, and is it possible in a second term that you would be uh, advocating further cutbacks? I have said repeatedly that programs like that, there are things that need to be done, but we must never pull the rug out from those people presently receiving uh, their payments in the program and dependent on it. Uh, you can't suddenly undermine them or break your contract with them. Reforms, if there are such to be made, must be made looking toward the future people not yet dependent and would have plenty of time uh, and warning uh, with regard to such changes. 
The, again, this was a, if you remember, that was the issue of the 1982 campaign. And uh, nothing had been done. We were guilty of trying to tell the Congress and our opponents that Social Security was facing financial disaster and it could hit it as early as July 1983. They denied that. I remember hearing the Speaker of the House himself deny that that was true. And then after the election was over, we all got together in a bipartisan group and without any animus came up with a plan to save Social Security because it would be broke by July of 1983. And we came up with that program. It wasn't a permanent answer to some of the problems, but it did buy us a great many years down the road before we would again be in a, in a fiscal a spot of that kind. Now, as to what we've done in Social Security, since we've been here, the average married couple in Social Security has had a $180 a month increase. So I, again, don't think that we were double-crossing anyone. Mr. President, uh, in 1980, West Virginia was one of, uh, I think, half a dozen states that voted for Carter. And now, four years later, uh, uh, unemployment is hovering around 15% in the coal industry and steel industry are ailing. And uh, some federal programs that West Virginians have depended on have been cut. What would you say to the guy in the street in West Virginia uh, to convince him that he should vote for you in, in 1984? Well, first of all, <clears throat> we know that unemployment is never consistent with the national average. I described this to some of our own people a little while ago that uh, to think that it is is like the man that drowned trying to wade across a river whose average depth was three feet. Uh, there are those pockets and certain areas that are going to be hit harder than others. But in the surge which in reducing unemployment, which is greater than anything we've seen in the last 30 years, even those hard hit areas are being benefited. More will have to be done. This is why we have, for a couple of years now, been trying to get the enterprise zone legislation uh, through the Congress, and it's been blocked. This is a program, and I was amazed when one of the candidates in the debate last night started talking about we must look at tax incentives to uh, help uh, industry and so forth, put people back to work. Well, that's what the enterprise zones are all about, picking those hard-hit spots, both rural and urban, and generating employment through the use of tax incentives. And so far, a number of states have gotten tired of waiting for the Congress to act and do it at a national level and have put in their own enterprise zone programs and every one of them is proving tremendously successful. Successful, But knowing that you might get around to unemployment, I just decided some figures might be of interest to you. You represent two, four, six, eight states and um, all in the same region. In every one of them, the figures for the peak of unemployment and the figures for, I can't give them to you except for one state now, but in December, as of the December level of the comeback, we're considerably down from the peak. And in the state that you just mentioned, your own, at the peak, unemployment in West Virginia was 21. By December, it was down to 15.7. Now, I don't know what it is today we won't know for a while because when Labor Department gives you the overall statistics, they don't break it down to states uh, at, the, at the present figure. It takes them a while to break it down as to states. So all I have are the November figures except for Florida. And that's because they do break it down for the 10 most populous states earlier than they do for the rest. Uh, Florida was 8.6 at its peak. Oh, wait a minute, Florida was 10.4 uh, at its peak, and in December was down to 7.5. But to give you an idea of what the rest of the figures may look like when we get them for the present, Florida is now down to 6. Ours was at 11.4 in December, and in January was back up to 13.5. Uh, 
I mean, some of that has to do with seasonal. That's Arkansas. Alabama. 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 Yes. It's creeping. Well, peak, it's creeping you, back up. But yeah. At, at the peak, you were 16.7. Mm -hmm. In December, you were 12.3. Now I don't know what the present one it's is. Well, in January it was 13.5. 13.5. Well, I think there'll be these fluctuations. I'd be very interested in seeing what it comes out as is from Is there February. anything else that you think that the states could do to um, help pull themselves up? Well, I think most states, as far as I can see, are doing all they can, just as we are. Uh, maybe, and you know, all of your states, particularly there in the Sun Belt, you're going to have to recognize also that your reduction in unemployment may be a little slower because of the migration to the Sun Belt. And that means that newcomers coming in without jobs and looking for jobs are temporarily going to distort the figures. Back on the economic issue for just one minute, back to the budgetary thing. Um, <clears throat> When you campaigned for president, one of your promises, of course, was to balance the budget by 1984. Obviously, it's not balanced. Um, I, wonder, I wonder what you look at as the main reason for that. What, what happened to Reaganomics that, that make it, made it not work like you wanted it to? Nothing happened to Reaganomics. Uh, and I'm glad you asked this, this question. Yes. I had the help of some of the finest economists in the country in working on the program that I call the Economic Recovery Program. And toward the end of the summer, 1980, I announced that plan and based our projections that yes, it could balance the budget by 83, based on all the projections of those economists at that time. Before the election, between that announcement and November, that projection was no longer valid because the economy in 1980 it was deteriorating so fast and had not been projected to do so by any of these notable economists. No one had. So it continued to worsen. And by the time of uh, the inaugural, uh, then even a later time was beyond any prediction. It had continued uh, to get worse. That was when interest rates were 21 and a half. Uh, Inflation then for 79 and 80 had been double digit both years. Now when we, when I started, you've got to remember that the president comes in not with his own budget. You are still bound until the following October by the budget of the previous administration. Nor was my program in effect. We were still trying to get it and in July of 1981 was when the further big dip came. Uh, now some economists have said, well, we had a 1979-80 recession and then the thing that happened in July was another, a different recession. Well, I don't think so. Things were, it was a continuation and the bottom fell out uh, with the interest rates that stayed high, the automobile industry, the housing industry, either one of which could start a recession by itself. So nothing of what happened and the great surge to 10.8 percent in unemployment. None of that could be attributed to our program because our program hadn't started. And then as our program was implemented, and remember it was only implemented in stages, it took three years to get the 25 percent tax cut, uh, other things that were implemented, and we never got all of the spending cuts. As a matter of fact, we got a little less than half of what we asked in spending cuts. And to that's to this day. Now, I could turn around and say that maybe the recovery might have been even better if we had gotten, remember that one stage of our tax cut, 10% of it, was going to go into effect retroactively to January of 1981. And we didn't get it uh, then, and when we did get it, after the, the drop had occurred, it was only 5%, and it didn't go into effect until October, which meant that it was about one and a quarter percent uh, 
when it only went on for three years, or three months. And so I have to say that all of the recovery has taken place after our, recover, after our program went into effect. And none of our program was in effect when the bottom fell out. Mr. President, can I, I want to get clear on one thing. Are you, your comments earlier about this, uh, about this bipartisan, uh, bipartisan meetings over the deficit, and you said you're now pursuing your own plan with, with, with other Republicans, with Republican leaders. Are you saying that you've abandoned altogether any, any hope of reaching any kind of compromise with the Democrats? Are you well, through I hope talking? May, no, I hope that maybe when we come forth with this plan and say, look, here's something now, we'll tell you we're ready to go with. Here is a plan I would like to have, because you can't, we can't get such a plan unless we have bipartisan support. I would like to think that they would do it. But I, what I meant was that to sit down with them and start from scratch to negotiate, they were very unwilling. We had great difficulty getting them to even meet. And finally, uh, one meeting, they just simply walked away on one issue and uh, refused to talk. Then they came back, and uh, it wasn't very encouraging to us. And you still don't have, you don't have any idea about how, how soon you might have a plan ready to put forward before, I mean, I'm hoping before very, the elections, though. Oh, it, Lord, I'm hoping very soon, not the election. We've got to move. We've got to move in this deficit matter and move fast. Some of your, some of your economic advisors have been, have been saying for some time now, and Wall Street analysts, that we've got to do something about the deficit. And, and uh, you've just said it needs to be uh, uh, handled or taken by the horns as soon as possible. But you have been saying for some time that uh, are painting the picture that things are going to be fine, things are going to be okay. And that's not exactly the picture that's, uh, that's come from some of your advisors uh, if we don't take control of the deficit uh, immediately. And I'm wondering well, uh, how... <laughs> uh, it, it is an inexact science. <laughs> some of the economists, uh, and some of them, I think, are trying to scare the Congress into uh, recognizing that we should be dealing with it. But let me just point not something. Not scare you, but the con. No, the not con scare me, no. Because look, I'm not, I'm not one to underestimate the deficits. I've been talking about them for 30 years. Is it impossible for us to, well, no, you can't remember all of you, you're too young. So it would have to be history for you. But for almost half a century, the other party has been in control, as I said earlier, of both houses of the Congress. And that Congress is the only one that can deal with these things. A president has a veto power, but a president cannot spend a single dime. There's nothing in the Constitution that gives the president the right to spend anything. But for almost this half century, we have every year run deficits. It was almost a trillion dollars by the time we came here. And there were many of us who opposed this. And we were told at the time that the national debt didn't matter because we owed it to ourselves. That was the explanation. We were told that deficit spending and a little inflation was necessary to maintain prosperity. Well, some of us uh, didn't think that added up. And I can show you speeches I made 20, 25 years ago in which I said inflation cannot continue without going out of control eventually. You cannot go down this road. The deficit spending and the piling up of the debt, that uh, it has never worked in history and never will. Well, now suddenly, with the big dip that came in July and that recession, with millions more people added to the unemployed who became wards of the government, which increased the spending, but who were no longer paying the taxes, which decreased uh, that, the very fact that we improved the inflation figure also militated against government revenues because inflation is a source of tax increase. And uh, we didn't get, we didn't think we could reduce inflation that fast. We thought that there would be uh, higher revenues than it turned out to be because of licking inflation. Well, all of this for them now to suddenly become aware of deficits. And yet, when you try to talk to them, what is the only answer that they have for curbing the deficit? Increase taxes. Well, and they'll, they'll also agree to cut defense spending. 
Well, defense spending right now is down to a little more than a fourth of the budget. Defense spending historically, the days of Jack Kennedy, was virtually a half of the budget. Under Jack Kennedy, it was 47.8 percent. So, the, and the increase in taxes, uh, they doubled taxes in the five years before we got here. And the budgets incre the deficits increased. Because when you increase taxes, they increase spending. And may I point to the 1983 budget resolution passed by the Democratic majority in the House. And they really didn't think that it would ever amount to anything or be passed by anyone else. But if you'll remember, they described it as a reaffirmation of democratic principles. And it did call for somewhere around $70 billion recovery that we're now having and put us back where we were. But beyond that, they've made it plain. And indeed, their own candidates talk of new spending programs. When you're on the campaign trail, how much of an issue are you going to make the school prayer issue and the abortion? Well, I'm hoping that before I get out there that we'll have a school prayer amendment passed uh, in the Congress. And here again, the effort that is being made to portray that as some way, somehow we're, we're talking compulsory prayer, or we're going to compel the schools. I'm sure there would be some schools, all we're asking is that they have the right to if they want to. Now there may be some schools that'll decide not to. There may be some that'll decide they will. But I think it's a right that we had for the bulk of our entire history in this country, and it didn't destroy the country at all. Matter of fact, crime rates were lower, and. Uh, we didn't have drug epidemics and all sorts of things. I could ask a question about drugs. Uh, I, uh, I know there was a lot of reports, including administration reports, there are more illegal drugs coming into this country than ever, especially cocaine, much of it coming through Florida, despite intensified enforcement in Florida and elsewhere. Would you say that that represents a failure of that drug strategy? And, and what would you want to do to uh, would you be advocating anything to improve? Well, now, wait a minute. I'm going to have to ask for, you know, I have to tell you something about this room. I don't know whether you've noticed or not. Out there in that center of the room under the dome, you kind of disappear a little on me. I'm a mild man of reporter. I'll speak up. Oh, dear. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> I was asking about the, the uh, illegal drug shipments into the, into the country. Oh. And uh, the evidence is uh, that there's more illegal drugs coming in than ever before, at least in, in recent years, and despite intensified enforcement in Florida and other places. And what I'm wondering is whether you, you think that uh, because of that, uh, that there's going to be a need to change the drug enforcement strategy and whether the uh, drug enforcement strategy that you've employed has been a success. Oh, well, then, wait a minute. Then this, if, if this is a new figure uh, that I haven't haven't obtained, our task force in Florida, which is the first time that we have ever put the federal government, the state government, and the local authorities, the drug enforcement authorities, and the military involved in trying to head this off, this shipment from out of the country coming in, was so successful in Florida that this is where, uh, why we went to 12 such task forces all around the, the country on our borders to to try and have the same success. Of course, it's, there's no question. When you've got the coastlines that we've got and the borders that we have, uh, I don't think you will ever solve the problem totally by intercepting the drugs. The answer is going to be the kind that has Nancy down in, in Houston. To really be successful, you're going to have to take the customer away from the pusher. The customer is going to have to start saying no. And this is, this we're embarked on also, as you know, with great efforts all through the country. But the figures that we have is that, that uh, and the reason for the rest of the other 11 task forces were, that we so slowed it down in Florida and reduced it in Florida that they began seeking new entry points around the country. But we're the owner now of a fleet of cabin cruisers and yachts and uh, airplanes and helicopters and trucks and cars. And down there the last time I was 
in Florida, I remember being taken into a big building there at the airport and shown what we had intercepted, but also on a table that was about the size of that desk. The first time in my life, I saw $20 million in cash stacked up there in bills that had been taken away from the drug dealers. That had to hurt. But uh, no, I think the program is being very successful, but we know that it is, it's a wholesale business. It isn't just a fellow on a corner with something in his pocket uh, to sell. It is coming in in freighters, it's coming in in airplanes and everything else. But the, we've stepped up our efforts and, and uh, have been tremendously successful. Do you think the military can be used to stop, like particularly some of the drug smuggling that's coming in on that mobile corridor that's being flown inland? What we used was we used their uh, radar facilities, also their, their uh, uh, air surveillance uh, for information that uh, we needed. I don't think they actually participated in any of the arrests, but they uh, provided the surveillance and the information for us. If they can see an enemy coming in, I can see that. I had just one final question for you related to defense. This year, for the third year now, you're requesting the defense budget funds for chemical weapons production. And of course, it's, Congress has narrowly defeated these proposals for the last two years. There's been a suggestion made in the last week by some Democratic House members that any proposal for funding for chemical weapons should be tied to legislation requiring the administration to make a new initiative on talks with the Soviets on, on uh, chemical weapons control. So my question is, first, do you think that the United States is doing all it can in this area? Sh would you agree to a proposal like that? And also, do you see any reasons now why Congress might be willing to pass chemical weapons uh, appropriation when they haven't been? If they were responsible, they would, because the very thing that they're talking about we are going to be ready very shortly to table uh, a treaty uh, for discussion of banning chemical weapons. We know that's the way to go, but the reason why they would be more of help if they would okay the spending is how better to get the other side then to agree to a treaty with us banning this, how much better able we'll be if they know that if they don't do that, they will have to face the fact that we have chemical weapons that we can use against them. In other words, it's the same as in the nuclear field. It's a deterrent. And this is, a, so this is exactly our own plan. Yes, we, we want to uh, get them into a verifiable treaty banning nuclear, or banning chemical weapons. Mr. Would, you, would you agree to have it written into the legislation? What? What? Would you agree then to have it written into the, the authorizing legislation that the U.S. would have to do this? Uh, I don't know whether that would, uh, I don't know whether that would help or not. There wouldn't be any reason why we shouldn't be willing since we ourselves are working on such a treaty. You've got some congressmen, a whole batch of congressmen this afternoon, so we've got to break up. Serves them right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I'm sorry, we get them all here. Has, has Mr. Have you talked to Mr. Wick uh, just lately about the possibility of resigning? Is he sent you a letter of resignation or anything? No, be not a kind. There's never been a hint of it. I don't know where that letter came from. Not a not a word of it. Very, very so close he's not to spoken to you, and, no. and you still think that he's you still want him to stay? On. I sure do. Yes. Yep. He's done a great job. Would you like to hear about your own states, since I talked about a few of them? Alabama, 16.7, down to 12.3. Arkansas, 11.3. And remember, these are December figures, down to 9.4. You know about Florida. You know about Georgia. Uh, Mississippi, 13.8, is down to 10. South Carolina, 11.6, is down to 7.9. Only two-tenths of a point above the norm, or the average. 13.7 for Tennessee, down to 10.3, and 21 down to 15.7. And that was December, and we've done even better in January and February. And as you still are you going to continue to insist on what? Mr. Meese as your nominee for the Attorney General? Heavens, office, yes. Yes. Questions uh, being raised now I, about the Carter Papers and about his loans? All of that, we happen to know that they sent for those when they couldn't get him on anything else. 
They sent for those from the Albasta Committee. Those are part of the record that, that the FBI said, as, as far as they're concerned, there was no criminal action, there was no misdeeds, and closed the investigation. But you don't believe any ethical questions have, being, have been raised at all? I don't think he violated them. I have every trust in his ethics and have known him for a great many years, and I think he'd make a fine attorney general. You think Thanks the American for, people for would be able to trust him? Right what? <laughs> what? You think the American people would be able to yes. trust him as attorney general? I trust him more than some of the senators that have been raising these issues. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. President. Thank you. Right. I understand Lisa Wallace gave you a note. Are you going to act on it? Who? The, who? Mrs. George Wallace. <laughs> uh, uh, no. <laughs>